Um, yeah, it seems that yeah everything is ready. So let's start. Uh, welcome everyone. Mm -hmm. And today we are happy to have uh, Fyodor Bezrukov, and he will explain us um, something about Higgs inflation. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Please start. Okay. Thank you for the invitation. Nice to speak back. Uh, as far as I understand, this is Moscow State University. So haven't given well, haven't given the talk here for a long, long time. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so I'll try to tell some things that we know about Higgs inflation and uh, what are the problems in it. Okay, why it's good and what are the problems in analyzing it, and why reheating is interesting. Uh, for analysis of the Higgs inflation and um, why it's connected to the problems. Uh, <clears throat> so first, um, what I would uh, suggest that uh, please don't hesitate to ask questions uh, in any way that's comfortable to you uh, at any moment, or tell me that I'm going too slow, too fast, because after the introduction from Dima, I'm not sure uh, what auditorium I'm speaking to. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Mm. So, uh, where are we? Right here. So, let's start. So, uh, first, what do we know about physics in principle? So, okay. I'm going to begin with. So we know that there is standard model of particle physics, which is a gauge theory with SU3 times SU2 times U1 group uh, with a set of particles. Uh, they are extremely good, working fantastically well. And some time ago, so now already 11 years ago, uh, oh, nine years ago. Nine years ago, Higgs was discovered on the LHC, uh, which actually made a non-trivial statement that uh, we measured the mass of the Higgs, and that was a non-trivial take, uh, non-trivial discovery from the collider that tells us that we can actually work with standard model up to pretty high energies. It's not uh, going to turn into something awfully complicated. It's perturbative up to high energies. Well, if you add uh, gravity to it, then you also get cosmology in the theory. So you can explain the universe. Uh, you get Planck scale, which is actually a bit good. Uh, you don't really have to worry at any scales about Planck scale because there some new complicated theory happens. So very nice. Why do, why we are not fully happy? So the answer it is, is very simple. Uh, as far as we're speaking about physics, the answer, the answer to not being perfectly happy is that there are experimental facts that tells us that our theory is not working. And there are experimental facts in the, in, in the world that tell us that standard model is incomplete. And uh, here is more or less the full list of these facts. So the presence of dark matter, presence of baron asymmetry of the universe, inflation, and neutrino oscillations is the basically exhaustive set of really confirmed uh, observations in the world that tell that need some modifications of play of standard model. So for today we'll focus exclusively about on inflation. The rest is uh, surprisingly easy to explain. Uh, okay, what's inflation? So I was asked to give some uh, more general introduction to inflation, and we'll see whether we'll be able to move anywhere from introduction. So 
for this, let's return, uh, let's turn to uh, what do we know about the universe? Actually, if you noticed in my list of the uh, unexplained um, things in the world, uh, majority dark matter, baryon asymmetry, and inflation are actually cosmological observations. So uh, if you want to study what's unexplained, this is the most interesting thing to look at. So what do we know about the universe? We know that it is hot, okay, 2.73 photon Kelvin photons around, not too hot, but okay, thermal. It's expanding, that's we know for sure. And we know that if you look at on large scales, it's pretty uniform. And then as far as it's expanding, uh, one can guess that at the previous times it was much hotter. And eventually became very, very hot. And actually the problem here that inflation uh, solves and why, why it is needed is answering different types of questions uh, how this nice situation started. So pretty uniform expanding universe. Actually, uh, it was invented to solve a set of so-called problems of the Bing Bang, Bang theory. This is probably the, this set, the singularity, flatness, entropy, horizon problem. I will not go about all of them. They, they actually pretty similar uh, explaining, so asking why, what is the reason for the universe to start in, this, in that peculiar state that we see from different, slightly different points of view. Uh, I'll focus for a second about horizon problem. And uh, actually much more important in my understanding problem is uh, how perturbations on top of the uniform universe appeared. Because okay, we know that the universe is not exactly flat and there are some minor irregularities between different points of universe. Uh, otherwise we, wouldn't be speaking here if it was exactly flat, exactly uniform. <coughs> so that's pretty important. Uh, and turned out that inflation uh, after it was in invented actually solved this problem in a really nice way. Okay, so uh, short recapitulation of the main, in my opinion, okay, one, in my opinion, problem for, for Big Bang Theory is the horizon problem. So basically one can uh, ask what part of the universe, uh, so how the signal go propagates in the universe. Then one can uh, look back in time. So light goes over light cones and we see with this light up to some moment. We actually see up to pretty long time ago that the mom moment when, so at the nowadays universe is transparent when the universe was hot enough. Okay, it was a very hot plasma and plasma not transparent for photons. There was a nice moment that when the universe cooled and became transparent. And actually since that time, we still see photons. This is the cosmic microwave background. We look at it so, and we can basically calculate the amount of, so the size of the universe that we actually see in these photons from so the patch from which we see the picture. And actually uh, our CMB observations show that the universe is perfectly uniform what, in whatever direction you look with the precision 10 to the minus five, very, very, very uniform. One can ask and uh, could uh, say one point on the universe and another point in different direction of the sky, know anything about each other from the moment of the Big Bang, from the moment the universe started to expand. If we just assume that the universe was expanding as it was so, all the time, so like a, a universe filled with hot plasma, we'll see that actually know that there is a moment when everything started so the big bang. Uh, and since that moment, it was actually not that long ago before the moment of the uh, scattering, much so much shorter time than uh, from us to the 
last scattering surface. And actually, uh, from a point at the Big Bang, the region that basically could know so the for the photon that started in the or in the immediate moment could travel only pretty small period small distance so basically the sky is composed of out of many patches that were causally connected since big bang and for some reason they are exactly the same however they never knew anything one about each other so that's peculiar that's called the horizon problem so basically one needs to invent why the universe started exactly the same everywhere so it didn't know anything about other so other patches so and the second problem so so this is the first problem and however even this one can be imagined as not that much of a problem okay for some reason for me it's not that hard to accept that something happens exactly uniform okay it happens some mysterious law of the universe however there is a much more interesting question is so the first approximation the same the sky so if we look at the sky at microwaves at two centimeters we see this radiation from all directions so this is actually the actual photo of the sky in that uh, wavelength and it's perfectly flat so it's 2.72725 kelvin from any direction so you However, if you really zoom uh, on the contrast, calculate that, that so if so there are small perturbations on top of this very, very uniform perturbation, which have some peculiar spectrum. So there are some amount of larger, per, large, so perturbation of larger size, of smaller size. One can expand it uh, into say, Fourier modes, get some spectrum observed, which is pretty peculiar. It's a bit complicated. It all happens because of some uh, ordinary physics, some sound waves propagating and growing in the cell gravitating plasma. One can evolve how it happens. However, one can find that with time, this uh, uh, fluctuations in cell gravitating plasma tend to grow, what is called gene instability. So one can find how it happens. However, to grow, to start some perturbations, the perturbations should be there at the beginning. And it turned out that at the beginning, the perturbations are there and they're pretty peculiar. So they have some spectrum. They are not, say, constant. They're not scale environment. They, so the amplitude is a bit peculiar given by this formula. So it's, uh, it's not constant, but it depends on momentum or momentum of the size of so length of the perturbations with some some power law dependence so it's not small but not zero so one can explicitly see so the question appears here say two questions why it was flat in the beginning and okay why it's not actually flat uh, the solution to this which was suggested called inflation uh, found out that uh, if you expand the universe very, very fast at the beginning, basically expand it so that uh, instead of going along the lifetone, it artificially expands actually faster than the lifetone, expands it in an accelerated way. Then the region of causal connect connection grows faster uh, than the one that we see. Uh, basically, it moves. Uh, like kind of it removes the moment when it started and moves it to the infinite past. So reasonably simple. And it immediately explains their flatness problem. So basically you remove, move the big bang model, big bang, mo, big bang mo, moment to infinite past. Okay, yeah. The picture is in conformal time, but uh, that's not that important. So one problem it solves. It will solve also immediately the flatness problem because you, when you inflate something, so you get a say very large sphere is actually flat. Uh, <clears throat> so the next question is how to realize it. So 
we need something that gives very, very fast expansion for some time. So that's actually easy. We, so those who, so I presume that you all know GR. So if you add cosmological constant to the solutions, cosmological constant is a very peculiar matter. It's a matter with negative pressure. It leads to exponential expansion of the universe. And that's actually good. Actually, we now live in the, if you look carefully, we now live in this, uh, in this situation. We are now starting to expand exponentially. Very good. Unfortunately, if you just add vacuum, to, vacuum energy to the system, which we have, this will last forever. So everything else will die off, dilute, decay. The cosmological constant which will stay. This is not what we observed because somehow we had a period of uh, normal hot universe. So some translation should stop. So what was suggested? So the, the canonical story about uh, inflation is to try to make cosmological constant, which actually changes with time and disappears after the period. How it's realized usually you add some scalar field to the model. So what that happens, then uh, the evolution of the scalar field is described by two equations. Uh, uh, and again, so at the moment I'm speaking about just the uniform background evolution. So I will just write the scalar field, which is space independent, constant everywhere in space, independent time. Uh, and then there are two equations that govern it. So first the field rolls down the potential. So this is field, this is the potential and the field rolls down the potential governed by a very simple equation of, equation of motion. However, so there is acceleration force because of derivative of the potential. There is a term which is, looks like a friction term if you look at it, at this equation due to the expansion of the universe. If the universe expands, it's okay, slightly harder to feel for the move, for the field to move. And at the same time, the Hubble, so H is the Hubble rate, rate of expansion. This Hubble rate is given by the energy density of this field, by the potential energy density and kinetic energy density. It has very, very small situations. Basically, there are two interesting situations. Normal that people usually think about. If, if you start, if this Hubble is negligible, then your field just oscillates well, with some small friction, so some decaying oscillations. Not very interesting, just ordinary quantum field. However, there is another regime. If you think that <coughs> your friction is very large, your motion of the field reaches saturation, you get bas basically you fall into a viscous medium and reach maximum, so maximum speed. Uh, and then basically you move very, very slowly about around the potential. You move very slowly as far as the friction is large and the friction is basically constant with time. So basically what you want for inflation. And so you move slowly. Well, then at some moment your Hubble becomes small and you move to the <coughs> dump distillation. Great. And this period of slow roll gives you near exponential expansion where accelerated one solve the problem. At the same time, it turns out this was, I will not describe in, in that detail, uh, perturbations of the field on top of this. Uh, perturb so as far as this is a quantum field, it has some perturbations which are generated uh, and one can calculate how large uh, perturbations are being generated at each moment of time. Basically, a typ typical Hubble scale. They get generated, go outside the horizon, go frozen, and then give rise to the observed perturbation. <clears throat> One can then cal calculate them and basically, uh, nicely, surprisingly, you mean you 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 see that uh, the moment you ask for this inflation to uh, 
be slow enough and long enough to, ex to explain our universe being flat enough, you nearly immediately get that the perturbations are pretty nearly scale invariant, but not exactly scale invariant with some correction from the field moving along this potential. And require, then one can ask if you want them to be of the observed size, or if you want the CMB observation to be not too large of the order of 10 to the minus five, one can put a constraint on the potential. So asking one number to be measured, 10 to the minus five, tells us about the potential. What it tells us, for example, if the potential is a quartic field potential, the coupling constant should be very, very small, 10 to the minus 30. Or the mass should be, if it's massive field, 10 to the 13 G. So either a very heavy field or a very weakly coupled field, field doesn't really look like what we have. Uh, and one more statement that if you go further into, uh, uh, into the story, so you can calculate the properties of these perturbations in more detail. So basically, uh, what properties of perturbations generated during inflation and observed in CMB are there? So one is, as I said, amplitude. Another is the dependence on the momentum, the slope. So the amplitude just fixes some parameter in the potential. The slope is something very close to one. And then there is another interesting parameter you actually got quantum fluctuations of gravitational field, gravitational perturbations also, you're generating primordial gravitational waves, which you are so-called tensor modes, which you are going to see in CMB also. And it turns out that this one, the last one is actually just proportional to the energy scale of inflation. And if you look at the predictions, uh, so basically, if the potential is convex, basically you get it, the energy at, at inflation too large. So you actually like potential that look like this concave. Otherwise you already violate uh, the limit on the possible gravitational wave during inflation. And again, so lambda phi to the four is clearly not convex. So where does it get it? So the question, the solution or the answer appears uh, in the question. So can we use actually, yeah. And the third problem that we have, uh, we just don't have too many scalar fields observed, but we have one, we have Higgs. Can we use Higgs for inflation? And the answer is yes, we can. It's actually a pretty long old idea uh, from eighties. Uh, but that uh, uh, later we realized that actually we can try to apply it to even our Higgs boson. Oh, just a second. Uh, wait a, a moment. Okay, I have to excuse myself, that was my mind. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so what one can observe that the normal action for the scalar field for the Higgs, so has two parts here. So the action for the scalar field has the Einstein action. However, one can write also high order operators coupling a scalar H, our scalar field H, and the Ricci curvature, writing the term H squared R. Uh, actually, one can even think that one has to write such terms if one studies uh, a scalar field in the curved background. Uh, how one can work with this model? Actually, this is a bit complicated on the first side, because if you start writing equations of motion for the scalar field, this term is pretty horrible. It has, it's actually a kinetic R 
is actually kinetic term for the graviton. So it actually mixes the kinetic term so between the Higgs field and the gravity. So pretty uncomfortable. One can. Uh, however, one can uh, do a uh, so. Uh, yeah, one can do a pretty trick that I will describe on the next transparency. However, the first observation here is that if you look at this pair of the terms, one can see that uh, effectively what one could call a Planck mass, so mt squared, so something that's standing in, start of, in, in front of Richard Kovacs is becoming my m Planck squared plus constant Higgs squared. So at large values of the field, the Planck mass effectively becomes proportional to the Higgs field, to the H, and actually all other ma masses, all other scales in the model become proportional to the same field. So basically one expects that everything is scale invariant after that, which makes it uh, hopeful. I hope that this is kind of a good idea you know, to get, get inflation. So the trick to do it is very simple. One can actually just define new variables. Instead of g mu nu, which our field, we use the field g mu nu hat, which is multiplied by this coefficient that's standing in front of r. It's just renaming variables, nothing more. OK, we can change variables in, in, in any model. After, after, after you do it, so there are some more uh, tricks that after you do it, you get the kinetic term for the Higgs, which is very very not nice. You can rescale the Higgs field also, so change to a new field high. And you get to the thing that is called Einstein frame, as opposed to the previous action, which is called Jordan frame. Uh, don't get misleaded by the word frame. It means actually nothing. Uh, so you get in the new variables, the action looks pretty nice. It looks normal Einsteinian gravity, normal field. The only thing that is peculiar is the potential got complicated. And then we can use all the machinery developed for the usual inflation, the equations that I have just uh, written for slow roll, one can use it. And just the story is encoded in the potential, which becomes very different. So at small values of the field, it's quartic potential. At large values of the field, the potential becomes actually exponentially flat and actually goes to a constant, which, as I suggested, is a convex potential, very, very flat, and it has new constant psi. And uh, if we want no probe a delta t over t, we instead of requiring small constant lambda, we can require large constant psi. And nicely, it will give us an inflation. Also, the moment, okay. You fix this, the only coefficient that's relevant for inflation is here. So you basically unambiguously get, get the prediction in the range of the parameters that you expect from inflation somewhere in the very middle. So in the what people observe, spectral index, tensor to scalar ratio, you basically get a point here. Excellent. So basically, this is uh, the story about introduction. Uh, now let's uh, let us think if what I was telling is correct or not. Sorry, can I add something? Yes. Uh, so how do you can can you tell like if you do experiments uh, on a collider, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like measuring some kind of Higgs processes? Mm -hmm. Do you measure uh, potential in the Jordan frame or Einstein frame? Okay, that question is uh, for the collider, it is a bit irrelevant, frankly speaking. Why? Uh, uh, it's irrelevant just for the, so, so remember that psi is very, very large number. And the corrections to the, so any corrections, which, so, so when you write, your theory in either of the frames. Uh, you get in both frames for 
small field, small, so in Planck, divide, for field smaller than in Planck divided by Xi, which is still 10 to the, uh, what it is, 16 G, 10 to the 15 G, you get either potential in uh, Einstein frame with very, very small corrections modified by this, or you get um, can, terms in the kinetic term, which additional are modified and again suppressed by the same scale. So basically we're not going to see any difference. Then, uh, so, so another point is, again, is the question is not very well stated. What you mean, you are, me, you are observing the system in the uh, Jordan Einstein frame. What you're observing is you're observing scattering of some uh, states, right? Mm -hmm. So what's your procedure? You should define plane wave solutions, nicely calculate them, calculate the interactions. So use uh, LSD procedure, get the scattering matrix. I can do this exercise in both frames. And the moment I do it correctly, basically the moment in basically in one in one frame I will get nice interactions in the potential in other I will get funny terms in the kinetic term the moment I do the calculation up to the physical observable that the answer will be the same so mm -hmm. important point is that so that the question should be asked not in terms of frames but in terms of physically observable objects so for, uh, so, so for colliders, you can explicitly see it in LSD. Here in, in, during cosmology, you can answer this question that, okay, you are not observing H or Rho, you're observing some so perturbations of density at late time. And uh, as far as your equations in two different frames are pretty complicated, Okay, solve equations in one over the frames, calculate in this frame the object that will be energy density of, say, radiation of the uh, say photon scalpel to this H. And then again, the answer will be exactly the same in both frames. So the question is the amount of work that you need to do to get to the answer. Mm -hmm. okay. But but here, like the potential that you put, uh, like the last term, is clearly motivated by yeah by the standard model. Yes. But yes. I I think you could have put there something else like exponent that you needed yes. without, yes. and then yes. you wouldn't have to generate it by like changing. Uh, exactly. So so that is the uh, that is a different question. That's a question not about experimental observations, but about what model I think I want to write. And here we are entering on the complicated path, uh, which will actually cause the problems that I'm going to discuss in, 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 in some sense. So it uh, basically, if this part is absent, so this part is absent, right? then I know that the theory written like this is very, very, very good, kind of renormalizing. Right? Mm -hmm. Then I know that this term, okay, it's truly there because it's gravity. However, at the same, at the moment I write this term, life becomes slightly bad. Then I can start adding these terms, thinking that this is kind of the first correction that appears in some sense. And then I can try to work with it. So this is a motivation of this one. However, if you go to a strict QFT uh, arguments, you can just say, uh, you can, yeah, you can from the very beginning write the potential like this. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that that is possible that will, that will be a different theory actually, because, okay, uh, strictly speaking, uh, what I have to think about is how my 
uh, other particles are also coupled, right? So here I will have, say, you cover H psi bar psi. And here the question, what would be here? H, you cover H psi bar psi or something different, or say omega. So there will be a, mm -hmm. a set of arbitrariness appear. As far as the theory is non-normalizable, strictly speaking, you um, cannot say which one is which. However, you can hope that uh, starting from this gives you something reasonably consistent. That, that's the logic. Okay, thank you. Uh, but again, so asking, so that's important to remember that asking which frame is physical uh, is not right because so any frame is physical, these are variables. Uh, and the correct question is, uh, why do you think your theory is in any sense allows you to calculate? So that's a, that's a more problem, <laughs> that's a better question. And we'll actually see that uh, our theory in a second is not that good. So, okay, so where are we? We are here, okay. So, yeah, do any problem appear? So, up to the moment, we neglected quantum effects. So the story that we uh, told was actually classical evolution of the fields. Uh, with some, okay, there was some quantum story about the generation of perturbations at inflation, which is actually a tree level process. So it's actually vacuum fluctuations at inflation. So it's kind of the same tree level story. So again, nearly classical. So what happens if we think about quantum corrections? The life becomes more complicated. I will not go into detail. I will, but so as, you can, you can see this answer in any frame. Again, you want, so I prefer working in Einstein frame. It makes it easier for me uh, as a simple field theorist to understand what's going on. Uh, so if you carefully write the potential in terms of the canonical and normalized field in the Einstein frame, which is he, your potential looks like the quartic potential of standard model plus corrections plus high order operator suppressed by the scale and Planck divided by psi. If you have high order operation, the theory is non-renormalizable or uh, you actually explicitly see that you still can work with this theory. However, the moment you start scattering the processes in this theory with energy above the energy scale standing here in denominator of this operator, you'll not really be able to calculate in this theory. Formally, your tree-level uh, tree level cross-section, tree-level probabilities will become larger than one, non-unitary. Uh, and if you look at actually the scale, so what's M Planck divided by Xi, it's a scale which is much lower than M Planck. And if you look at the scale at inflation, so the scale at inflation, okay, it's actually a bit lower. So because the energy scale that you're interested in during inflation is actually Hubble scale at inflation. It's square root of lambda and Planck divided by Xi, but okay, lambda is not that large. So it's a bit smaller than the scale, but not too much. Uh, okay. Okay, I, I, I like this transparency as you see, so it appears several times in my talk. Uh, Hello, I'm sorry, I have one question. Uh, in your previous slide, you, you mentioned about the high dimension operator. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I'm concerned for the quartic term, you can also add the Higgs, this is six term, not, not the chi six, that's the Higgs six. The power is a Higgs six. Yeah. So and and <laughs> so sorry. Can you and and uh, I, I I I I'm thinking what happens if we add the H six term over and Planck? Does it change a lot of the the you behavior can. of the potential? You can. Uh, 
so uh, the term h to the six divided by n Planck is not that dangerous at all. Uh, <clears throat> because uh, h that we are speaking here is not actually becoming larger than m Planck. If you look carefully, so you can. You can add the term h to the six divided by m Planck squared, and this will be virtually mm, invisible. Uh, another question is okay, which terms I want to add? That's a, that's a good question. So for the moment, what I am saying, I'm not adding this term. I see that in the theory that I'm, what I have written, these terms is written already in the theory. So my theory is the theory which on tree level has, so, so this is not an arbitrary number. If it's written like a number, but I can give you the value. It's, uh, it is lambda divided by, uh, I don't know, some six or, or so. So, it, so this number is written. So I have this term, right? So I'm not adding, I'm not adding and discussing uh, what happens if I add this term. I'm discussing that this term is in the theory and I have to deal with it. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. I so, see so, it. so that, so that's a, probably that's the important point. I'm not adding them at, by hand, I'm having mm -hmm. them, so. Yes. One more question. Uh, what is the value of lambda? Is it fixed from the standard model? Or standard lambda? model. This is this is standard model lambda. I'm speaking about standard model lambda. Okay. Uh, and so, another question. When so, you so, so that's uh, just so for everybody to be on the same page. So lambda is is not that small. It's actually zero 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 one ish, some number like this. Okay. It's not zero one because it's at high energy. It's become ah, okay. small. So, you, you can so it's standard model one, but the standard model at inflationary scale is okay, zero, zero, one at least. So it's not that large. Okay. <laughs> so because you the, don't know it exactly, but yeah, we don't know. We actually don't know it. We know that uh, we know that it's significantly smaller than 0 0.1 because we know that the Higgs coupling constant becomes smaller when you run with energies to high scales. And another question. When, mm -hmm. Another question. When you consider loop correction, you also get uh, some pure gravitational term, a square about a, a square term, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, so your uh, now your Einstein frame is not an Einstein frame. You should make uh, one more uh, conformal transformations. Oh. Yes, uh, um, these ones uh, norm are normally not that uh, not that relevant. You can you can if you want you can try to run things in the Jordan frame. So basically, all the story boils down to the fact that psi changes, but it doesn't it doesn't change too much. So basically, if I'm speaking about what's happening at inflation, I can take psi at that scale and use it there. So basically, I can go to the inflationary scale, take lambda and psi there, and live there. And uh, as far as psi today is not extra useful experimentally, I can a bit ignore running of psi. This is what I'm going to do. Running of lambda is important, and it makes significant differences because it can run to zero. Uh, but that's a complication that I was wanted to evade for today's talk. So, so, so basically, in short, running of lambda is most probably relevant. Running or oh, running of psi, running of lambda is uh, is relevant, and but that's a large large separate story. D did it make sense? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, as I said, so I. As I suspected, I wouldn't go through the introduction, <laughs> but okay. Uh, so 
as I said, so the Hubble scale of inflation is slightly smaller than this scale. However, the situation is even better. If you study the, the collisions of perturbations on top of the inflationary background, you should expand not about around x equals zero, but around inflationary background. And then your problematic scale for studying tree level processes. Again, at the moment, I'm, um, I'm not dealing even with loop corrections. So, so, so uh, bear with me, I'm even simpler. I'm dealing with the fact that if I have such an operator, then just tree level calculation above some scale gives unphysical results, probabilities larger than one. So just my tree level calculation would fail. Uh, however, again, as tree level calculations are always done on the background, on the on top of vacuum, or on top of the classical solution during inflation, you can see that uh, say scattering during inflation uh, get problematic at much higher scale. So one can actually calculate. So ignore the left picture, look at the right picture. So one can calculate the scale of H. So today I cannot calculate scattering above the scale and Planck divided by Xi. At inflation, I cannot calculate scatterings above and Planck. However, uh, Hubble scale at inflation is much, 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 much smaller than in Planck. Even energy density at inflation is much smaller than in Planck. So I kind of don't care uh, that I cannot calculate it any, at all energies. So practically, if I'm a simple minded person and want to do calculations of inflation, everything would work. There will be hidden problems with loop corrections, but that's uh, another story. So since uh, my model allows me to predict anything today, and Planck would divide by size a large energy, works at inflation as far as all relevant scale, energy scales at inflation are much below the scale where my tree level calculation would lead to contradictions, would start giving me probabilities larger than one. Should I be happy? Unfortunately, there is an interesting process in the between, which is called reheating or preheating. At the end of inflation, somehow the very empty universe field with uniform or nearly uniform field should decay and give rise to a hot universe. So somehow we should preheat. And then if you look during preheating, actually you are going as we'll see in a moment, if we'll have time, uh, to get significant problems. So how to study the model? So, so let's go through the way how one can study models, how one can mo make models better. So basically, we still have a model which has some problems at a Planck device. One can, the usual way of how people, uh, what people do, people study UV completions of the model. Uh, the simplest one that I am going to describe is uh, supposed by Emmer, worked by Gorbonov and the Anitok area, uh, is uh, add R squared term, one more term, which again, if you think about it, it should be there because of quantum correction. Uh, what is interesting with the with this term? So, for, so first, adding r squared gives you one more degree of freedom. So this is, and this is a high de, high derivative term. It gives you one more de, degree of freedom, which is actually a nice, good physical non So nice, good scalar called scalaron. Uh, and if its mass is then an interesting observation about pure r squared model is that pure r squared model independent of the parameters standing in front is a good nice uh, model up to and planck's up to planck scale without any problem so without any new scales which would have been introduced by in higgs inflation and if you put the mass of the scalar on below the problematic scale we have in higgs inflation then it actually turns out that the whole theory has completely no problem up to, up to Planck scale. Okay, it's an usual UV completion, uh, perturbative UV completion that 
below the problematic scale, you introduce a new particle and uh, the problems go away. Oh, there are more, more generic way, way of doing it originally so proposed by Judy Chile by adding uh, even slightly more generic one, but let's uh, focus on this model, which is kind of simple. Actually, uh, here a nice comment that basically we see that we are at the moment going to study a wider class of models. So we're kind of forced to study a wider class of models, something so one can go to the limit of Higgs inflation, which is not very good, or go to the limit of the when R squared term is dominating, which is actually the original inflation suggested by Starobinsky, the basically one of the first ones. However, if you look at them, the potential at inflation actually look virtually indistinguishable. So actually we are living in a wide class of models that are very, very similar during inflation. Uh, and we actually can go between these two regimes. So basically now we have two parameters, Xi and Peter. So, or, so basically this is Xi, this is basically beta. And one can go between these parameters. So, so there is a line corresponding to the probe inflation or observation. If you go to this range, you are going to get closer to R squared Higgs inflation. If you go here, you're going to be closer to the Higgs. In this very, very narrow range here, your Higgs uh, model will be uh, will will violate um, trilateral unitarity. However, everywhere else, you have a good model. So now the question: Okay, I, I don't have time for the rest, but let's try to uh, continue. So the question is: Can we actually study actually study reheating in the, in, the, in in any of these models, and uh, will be Will we be ever be able to distinguish between something from between them? Okay, the first attempt to study preheating. So, so now it's kind of a long story about uh, making attempts to calculate preheating and every time finding out something new. So, the first uh, idea of Post inflation reheating in the post after inflation, we have the background field that oscillates. And as far as it is the Higgs field, masses of the old imaginable particles also oscillate. They oscillate with some frequency omega, which plotted here. And sometimes the masses of the fields become actually smaller than omega. And at this moment, the particles are being generated. So the change of the mass of the perturbations and non-adiabatic, you generate particles and you preheat. Good. Then you can, basically the leading model turns out was uh, guessed to be the production of actually W bosons from the, uh, from the Higgs. Well, it was calculated some long time ago in 2009, got some estimate of preheating. However, soon after that, it turned out not soon after that. So in 2017, people realized that it's very important to do correct calculations. What are the correct calculations? As I said, what we need, we need the evolution of the mass of the field with time. So, and then basically by looking at the evolution of the oscillator with changing mass, changing frequency, we can see the parametric resonance of generating of this particle. Of this particle. However, the moment you write the massive scalar field, massive W bosons, basically you write the action, Proca action, F mu nu, A mu squared with time dependent mass. We all know that if we write time independent mass, this is just three, three bosons with mass M. No problem. However, uh, if the mass is time dependent, the life is complicated. Writing equation of motion from this action, try it requires to get to the usual Klein-Gordon equation for each of the three polarizations to project out these polarizations. And while uh, 
projecting out the transverse polarizations is easy, projecting out the longitudinal polarization, actually the projection operator actually differentiates over time this m squared of t. So in the moment you project it out, instead of ma of t, you get the horrible combination, which has time derivatives of this ma, so which completely disappears if ma is constant. So mass of the longitudinal boson behaves in a very different way. And actually it gets spikes. And these spikes are of the Planck, Planck height and Planck width. So basically on a such feature, you would expect generation of Planck momentum particles, which you don't want because you are now speaking about uh, values of the field of the order of Planck divided by psi, so way beyond cutoff. So basically your theory here, the Higgs inflation here would produce particles that are completely beyond perturbative control. And it was conjectured that the reheating is immediate, very heavy particles produced, you get immediate reheating. Unfortunately, so, so saying immediate reheating from the model, which is beyond calculability, beyond, uh, beyond the maximum energy that you can analyze is bad. So we switch to the regularized model with R squared. And in this model, okay, uh, here there are uh, lot, lots of bells and whistles of going into the Einstein frame and this model to be simple. It's basically you end up with the potential that looks like this, which sent Higgs and scalar on direction. And along this, so there are valleys. Uh, so, so the real vacuum is here. And then there is a valley, very, very narrow valley here. Along it, you have the inflation potential. So the field rolls down. And people looked at, so Minxi here uh, and Starobinsky group looked in this model at the changes of the masses of the modes, got that the mass of the field in this one has a nice large peak. So when the field moves here, so this was the spike that uh, was conjectured in the non-regularized version. However, the spike turned out to be very wide, very not very high, and not not producing any particles. So actually, the moment you regularize the model, there so this problematic object stopped leading to any reheating. The next immediate question appeared how it reheats them. And it turned out that uh, it is pretty non trivial. So let's look more carefully at this. So, so, what is, so this is the potential during inflation. So, we are where we arrive from this line oh, and start doing some. Look carefully at this part here. This part here is upside down. And depending on luck, depending on, so it's view from the top. So your field background can go down and reflect in one side, in a, reflect in, an, in another side, or can try to go basically exactly in the middle. If it goes exactly in the middle, the pot potential here on top is actually upside down, actually tachyonic. So. And then one can expect really fast production of particles at this moment. So one can basically really calculate the uh, masses of the particles, see that in, in this case, so this is time, this is basically uh, when you get on top of this, the masses of these particles become significantly tachyonic. And if you calculate the particles that are being produced, uh, blah, 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 this is the middle plot again. So you see that the amount of number of particles grows very, very fast and you reheat immediately. Uh, unfortunately, then it depends on the following question, whether you ever get to this 
place in the potential where you get the tachyons or not. And it depends on the parameters of your theory, basically on the relation between beta and psi in your theory. And you basically get that for some parameters of beta, you get to this place. For some parameters of beta, you don't get to this place at all. So the question is, what happens later? And another question is, a very careful reader would uh, notice that uh, on this plot, this is the energy. This is the energy in the background. This is basically the Hubble energy. And this is the energy in the produced modes. So we produced much more modes, much more energy in the generated particles than we have because we ignored back reaction. So now one can study uh, back reaction. OK. Uh, this can be done by full-scale uh, semi-classical simulation. One can, it's, one can, if the, mm, uh, one, if the perturbations, so if the coupling constants are small enough, after some time, one can replace the quantum fluctuations at the beginning by classical fluctuations and just follow the classical solutions of the equations. This is a typical way to calculate numerically reheating by then ex exactly solving the equations of motion of the scalar field. The advantage is that it, it's a bit, it's, it's large numerics. However, it gives you the whole answer, including all back reactions. And, uh, we did it, okay, well, I'm over time, so I'll skip the funny details uh, that explain why we actually, if before we were calculating in the Higgs-like regime, now we can calculate only in this R-squared-like regime, otherwise uh, the numerics, unfortunately, doesn't work. Uh, however, it will turn out not very uh, relevant. So one can calculate it uh, and really see, say calculating, with several efforts, the energy fractions, one can see that after uh, some moment, so you get you get into the tachyonic regime at some at some moment. After that, you have some chaotic motion, some uh, generation of particles, and you arrive to a nice full so reheating. So your whole energy moves to inhomogeneous modes. Okay, half of the energy moves into the in homogeneous modes. Uh, why would you inter be interested in that? You would be interested in that because uh, you want to know how long your reheating happened. Uh, because depending on how long your reheating happened and reheating, so you get the moment at inflation when the perturbation, observed perturbations were generated, happen at slightly different places of the potentials or different number of inflationary e fold. And because of that, uh, amount of expansion during preheating actually influences their value of their value of the, the prediction from inflation. And one can see, so again, depending on beta, so there are several predictions. So prediction for pure R squared, which is, which happens pre for pretty long time because it takes gravitational decay of the inflaton is pretty slow. Uh, the instant estimate gives you number of holdings like here. And our calculations gave some range um, in the range of beta here. So basically one could easily exp uh, expect that for more Higgs-like regime, nothing interesting happens. So we're already pretty fast. For more R-squared regime, there should be something interesting. And basically, if you compare what predictions for NS and R you get, so you get prediction, say, for the immediate reheating here, for the R-squared here, as, so in the immediate regime that we analyze in the middle. So the point is that uh, what are these green and, and red dots? These are uh, the precisions uh, of the next, uh, C, okay, next, next CMB experiment. So in principle, one can try to 
distinguish these two regions. Uh, an interesting note that actually even this one, so we have published, is not the end of the story. If you look carefully at this plot, you see that your rho inflation inflaton started to go down. And it will go down actually because you end up with a situation. So you preheated to the uh, radiation, your standard model got hot. You get inflaton particle in your model, which is a heavy long leaf particle, which will decay out of limp equilibrium and produce additional entropy release and change a bit number of effaultings further. So there is a next step after preheating, which still complicates the story. So this will appear soon. Uh, at this moment, I probably should stop because I'm already over time. So if you want, you can ask me uh, what happens in another variation of inflation. Uh, but basically to conclude what it is. So we have a very nice model when we can use relate Higgs to the inflation at the beginning. However, uh, attempts to study everything that happened using with this model forces us to be more careful. And if we want to make probe and numerical pre predictions, we actually need to study some models. Uh, we need to UV complete this model somehow. Uh, the one the way the one way that I know how to do is to add R squared and Higgs inflation, and then we actually get a family of variational models where, where one people can study with surprisingly complicated and interesting dynamics, and actually with some possibility to distinguish between between the realizations between the parameter in CMB observations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, can I ask who to experiment and the two of them together? Sorry, I don't hear you. It's distorted. Ah, uh, sorry, do you hear me now? Ah, yeah, now I hear you very nicely. Okay, so, sorry, uh, there is some delay in sound. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, what is the best way known to you to exclude and inflation? experimental way to exclude experimentally these models. Ah, so what's the best way to exclude these models? The best way to... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the best way to exclude both of these models is to discover uh, tensor modes. So this is by far the best way. So if you want to discover, so where is I have the, the plot? Which is ah, a okay. to, to so ah, okay, it's a bit an old plot, but uh, ah, I have a new one. Another the new one is here, yeah. So even this one is probably not the, the most up, ah, okay, reasonably up to date. So the predictions of all these models give tensor to scalar ratio somewhere here, 10 to the minus three. So at the moment, the precision that we have, so it should be smaller than 0, 0 0.1. So at the moment you see tensor, the tensor to scalar ratio somewhere here. Okay, mm -hmm. forget it. Oh, at least, okay, to be more precise, forget it in there, forget it without doing some uh, significantly funny fine tuning. Mm -hmm. Further, so another you, question. Uh, yeah. What is the best way to, to differentiate between these models? Sorry. Ah, to differentiate between these models. To, 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 to. That's exactly what I, what I yeah. said. So the only way to differentiate. So basic, mm, 
most probably the only way to differentiate between these models is again to look at CMB carefully because these models provide slightly different reheating. Okay. Basically, mm -hmm. R squared like give parameters somewhere here, Higgs squared like give parameters here. So, so this and R. And this, uh, these blobs here are. Okay, sorry, I forgot which experiment, which future experiment was plotted on this plot. But some of one of the future CMB, um, CMB experiments, that's so this red and green areas are its precision. Mm -hmm. So at least the very far regions you will be able to distinguish. Okay, thank you. So, so this is by far the, the best way. So, uh, and uh, as you notice, to distinguish them, actually, that's a, a good question. <laughs> to distinguish them, it's much better to look. So to exclude them, you basically really want to measure R. R is nice. To distinguish them, you really want to measure nicely NS. And actually, this is good because NS will probably happen. Mm -hmm. Thanks. On, and if you go to 21 centimeter, you can measure it really, really nice. Well, having said that, of course, uh, if you ask the physicists, then they, they will, they already invented way out of these exclusions, but okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, let, let's leave it aside. Hello, hello. Yeah. I have another question. Uh, I, I read the paper from the Japanese group about the the, the preheating thing, but uh, which, which, seems, which which one? <laughs> the, the, the paper who claim there are some problem uh, during the preheating. Mm -hmm. If the C is uh, if the C if C is very large. But for C is smaller than 100, it seems we, we have no problem, right? Yes. Uh, mm, okay. So uh, the problem happens uh, if, yes, if you have large Xi you have clear problem in the non-regularized inflation. And yes, if your Xi is not very large, then the problem becomes uh, easier and easier. Yeah, and then uh, I want to... And uh, basically uh, what it means, so as far as an inflation, the fixed number is square root of lambda uh, divided by xi. So this one is the object that should be small. Yes. So if you want small xi, you need small lambda. And this you can do. This you can do. Uh, so actually, I probably even have a slide, or maybe not. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Okay. Not. Uh, okay. Mm. Ah, okay. Let, let's 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 leave it here. So you can arrange for the situation with very small lambda by mm, so you can actually, as far as lambda runs with energy, you can arrange lambda to be very very small at inflation. And then if you tune it to be very, very small, you can get to the situation when Xi is not where, is also reasonably small, say of the order of 100. And then one can hope in this particular situation to calculate uh, reheating without asking for anything. It, uh, okay, there are some, some problems with this because uh, actually then all your scales will become a bit close, but you can try. So, so there is a re regime where everything can be calculable without any, without any regularizations. 
Yeah, so, so my question is, what is the general heating temperature in this case? So we do not- In need, this case? Yes, yes. What is the general, the, the heating temperature? I don't know. Uh, I think in your previous slide, you mentioned about the, the, the calculation about the, the, the longitudinal contribution of the W and C and the, yeah, that should be some prediction of the general heating temperature. Yeah. Uh, one can try to, so, so that the answer is one can try to do it, but I don't know the numerical answer to it. So that's, uh, that's what, should, what should be done. Mm. It will be, oh, okay. It will be, uh, it, 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 it still will be not that small. It still, it, it still be 10 to the 10 is Gs. So one can, one can actually do the calculation. So, so Actually, in this case, to the frost approximation, uh, the answer is given by uh, the answer from the frost paper, basically, because you then ignore all, all other effects. Uh, with um, small, very small lambda, so I think, uh, what are they? They are, they are collapsing, I think. So, so. So in this case, one can try to one can try to make it. Okay, thank you, thank you. The other question I'm concerned is, uh, uh, as people some sometimes claim the the cortic coupling will go to negative at the hand disk U. So what happens in this R square Higgs inflation models? R square Higgs inflation model. Okay. So the story is a bit complicated. So if we put our Higgs mass today uh, to the situation that lambda becomes negative in uh, at large scale, uh, then in uh, Higgs R squared model, uh, uh, the following thing happens. So if you also make the scalar on sufficiently light, what wish you can do? Mm. Uh, basically, you can make a scalar on lighter than the scale where I have that picture. Mm. Yeah. So one can say say that say. Lambda becomes negative at 10 to the 10 G. One can make the scalar on lighter than this scale by choosing sufficiently large beta. Mm. And then the running above the scalar on is going to be changed because basically then you have an additional scalar degree of freedom. And in principle, it can even change it so that it basically never becomes negative. This was uh, noted by in the work by Gorbonov and Tokarev. Mm -hmm. So, oh, however, okay. Or if one, if one put them another way around, then uh, this situation can uh, lead to a completely not working model. Yeah, that's also possible. So basically there are options there. So, so if you uh, put scalar on light enough, then you can easily get, then you can cure this model actually. If not, okay. If you basically have a very, very light Higgs today and this mu scale is very light, so you cannot put the scalar on below. Okay, then yes, then this, uh, this model would work. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you. I, I, I have a, so, sorry, I have another question. People sometimes even uh, talk about the, the cue ball formation. I, 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 I'm, I'm thinking whether the cue ball can form the if we have the Higgs inflation model. 
This is a general question. Which cue ball? Cue cue ball. So the if the potential the it, because Higgs has a have some charge, then they can have some cube. I don't know how to make cue balls in this model. Uh, so, so not not to my understanding. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. It's not that chart. It's gauged. So you don't have any. In principle, you don't have neither charge nor topology sustained uh, classical configurations in this model. So that uh, makes it hard to make a cue ball. Mm. Uh, but the, because, it, because the potential becomes flat at a very large value of the, the Higgs, then it's possible we could have the cue ball solution. So this, this is, I, I, uh, I, I have no other questions. So the, I, I have. Maybe, I, I, maybe, but uh, to make the cue ball in the region of the potential being flat for large values of phi, you also have to realize that the it's basically a decoupled system. Mm. So uh, you want. There is no global charge in the model. Yeah, 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 exactly. No global charges. But the Higgs it takes the U and Y charge. Which one? No. It's, it's, yeah. it's gauged. Yeah, but the, we could have the gauge the cue ball. That's all the possible. So. I, I have no answer for this, but uh, I'm just uh, thinking the possibility. Okay, if you find one, <laughs> tell us. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't think so. But at, at, at least I don't know. I don't know solutions of this type. Okay, anyway, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Fedor, can I also ask a question? Anya, hi. Yes. Hi, uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, sorry, just one second. Uh, let me just formally announce the end of the seminar so that people don't feel uncomfortable leaving and you are, of course, free to discuss. So, so thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming and have a nice evening. Thank you. Mm -hmm.